and beyond comprehension. So what you saw of Dr. J was clips. You see clips and highlights and you think, man, this guy can't do this all the time. At six foot six for the New York Nets, the fabulous Dr. J, Julia Servant. He was pretty much the ABA. That's all we really heard about. Even before I joined the ABA, only one I really knew about was Julia Servant. Welcome back to Victory Yard. I'm Al Troutwig, and you're watching Classic Sports. When I was a kid growing up on Long Island in New York, I was a ball boy for the New York Nets of the ABA, the American Basketball Association, and as a result, became one of the few people who had a chance to see up close and personal Julia Serving at his very best for a long period of time when he was in the ABA. Since the ABA had very little national television exposure and received very little press coverage, its history is one of the few remaining mysteries in sports. There's just very little documentation about what most people agree who saw it, a great time in basketball. In fact, one could say it is a lost classic. And here at Classic Sports, we pride ourselves on discovering those lost classics. Over the next two hours, we will detail Dr. J's career in the quote-unquote other league, from his days with the Virginia Squires to his championship seasons with the Nets and the first ever slam dunk contest in 1976, which he won. We'll hear from the men who were there, such as Hubie Brown, Artis Gilmore, David Thompson, George Gervin, and in a little while, Julius Irving himself in Victory Yard will join me, and we'll relive the New York Nets' 1976 championship season. So for those of you who don't remember or never knew that Dr. J was in a different league, let alone on another team before he was a Philadelphia 76er, sit back and enjoy Julius Irving in the ABA. Serving story began on the playgrounds of Roosevelt, Long Island. His high wire act conjured up memories of former New York playground legends like Connie Hawkins. But Irving was determined to carve out an identity of his own. And when I uh, left to go play in the pros, Julius was playing in Harlem in the same area where I was playing in. And he was out there doing some things that they saw me do, and uh, they started calling him Little Hawk. And so one time he went in for a shot and dunked, and everybody started calling him Little Hawk and jumped up and yelled and screamed. And he called time out and he went and grabbed the microphone and said, my name ain't Little Hawk, my name is Dr. J, don't you forget it. After a stellar career at Roosevelt High School, the young doctor left Long Island for the University of Massachusetts. Although he received little exposure in then basketball Barron, New England, Irving dominated. He averaged 26 points and 20 rebounds a game in his two seasons at Amherst, becoming one of only six players in NCAA history to average more than 20 points and 20 rebounds a game in his career. In his first season of varsity ball, Irving led the Minutemen to 18 wins, their most victories in their 60 years of basketball. By his junior year, the college game was no longer a challenge for Dr. J, and he decided to forego his senior season and go hardship. Since the NBA did not allow the signing of underclassmen, Irving turned to the ABA, signing a four-year contract worth $500,000 with the Virginia Squires. Despite the flashy nickname, the Squires still weren't sure what they were getting in Dr. J. We got this kid that we think is pretty good, but we're really not sure. He's got big hands, and he looks like he can run and jump a little bit, but you're never really sure. Well, we had this practice, and I was dominant, and that showed up in the first three minutes. Here's this guy dunking and jumping and running, and I mean, it was just out to people who just like, you know, in awe. And I was like, somewhat wired. Johnny Kerr, who was the general manager, I was coaching a team, leans over to me and he says, um, I think we better get him out of there so he doesn't get hurt. I said, yeah, you're right. I took that as a compliment. <laughs> I said, all right, I'll give you the rest. During Irving's years at UMass, the NCAA did not allow the dunk shot. But now in the pros, the doctor was allowed to dunk. And the combination of his acrobatics with the freewheeling ABA created a perfect synergy. Once you got out of college and went to the pros, now it's like the chains are being taken off. You know, you can go with, uh, rec play with reckless abandon, you can go to the hoop with authority. In the ABA, 
was a perfect uh, stage for doing that. It was just frantic, furious action, and Dr. J was uh, so indicative of that style of play. He made it a lot of fun to watch. Although it wasn't Broadway, Dr. J quickly became the ABA's marquee headliner. He averaged 27 points a game in his first season and almost 32 a game in his second. But Irving's baskets did more than just add two points to the scoreboard. He's the only player that turned the crowd, sellout crowd at home, against your team. He would fly down the side and have those tremendous dunks and all the people at that time when Julius was coming down the side of the floor were starting to rise out of their seat looking for something spectacular to happen. I remember my first time seeing him play out in high school. He came to Virginia State College and he just put on a great show. Each time he paid a visit to one of those particular cities, the fans expected a lot. And he, on every, every night, he either met expectations or exceeded expectations. I never saw him have a bad night. You know, people love to see a show. Julius Irving was more than a basketball player to the ABA. He was the ABA, and the league would do anything to keep him from the rival NBA. After his second season, the Virginia Squires, in a move to keep Irving from signing with the Atlanta Hawks, sold the rights to Dr. J to the New York Nets for $500,000. Irving then received a new five-year deal worth $2 million, and he was now on his way home to New York. I don't anticipate having problems playing with any of the Nets. I, I think, uh, you know, I can play basketball with anybody as long as our objectives are the same, and that is to win. Coming up next, winning with style as the entire nation gets to see Julius Irving at his best. The 1976 ABA Slam Dunk Contest when Dr. J and the ABA returns on Classic Sports Network. More than 20 years after he first delivered it, we go back to look at the signature dunk of one Dr. J, Julius Irving. And boy, did that day change a lot of things. 1976, the American Basketball Association was desperately trying to hang on as an entity. The NBA was looming, and some people thought that there would be a get-together, but there were no guarantees. And so the ABA looked and scratched and clawed for every little competitive edge that they could find. One of the things they created was the first-ever slam dunk contest, and it was held in 1976 at halftime of what would be the very last ABA All-Star game, and it was in Denver, Colorado. Now, the first three contestants were the A-Train, Artis Gilmore, as he was called. He, of course, of the Kentucky Colonels. From the San Antonio Spurs, Larry Special K. Keenan. And then there was George the Iceman, Gervin. But they were only the preliminaries because everyone knew the duel was going to come down to the high-flying David Thompson of the hometown Nuggets and Julia Serving of the New York Nets. While many fans in the sellout crowd of 15,021 came to see a pregame show of Glenn Campbell and Charlie Rich, hey, who knew? They left talking about Dr. J. We turn it over now to Al Albert as he calls the original slam dunk contest between David Thompson and Julius Serving. The two remaining, David Thompson and Dr. J. And here is the Denver Nuggets, David Thompson. David Thompson finishing it with a twist around, patented, slam dunk, and now the doctor goes to work.
And that sends everyone really. Julia Servey. And the winner, Julia Serving. <laughs> and that sends everyone really. Julia Serving. It was uh, almost like a, a, a moment that just swept you away. Um, time stood still at halftime. Uh, I think everybody knew they were watching something that was very special. I thought I had a good chance to win it. You know, I had some dunks that were pretty unique, uh, you know, the windmill and the 360 that a lot of other guys couldn't do. You know, David was just 6'4", and he was jumping higher than anybody out there. You know, jumping off two feet, I mean, which was, uh, you know, a hard feat for anybody. And David goes out into the corner, and uh, he comes out of the corner, and he elevates. And then he does like a complete 360 degree turn and then he dunks the ball and he's in his home town you know we're in Denver so we're in his building and the building just you know goes bananas about it and I'm like uh oh I think I'm in trouble when it came down to Julius Irving and you know he knew he was behind in points to David it became a match race between the two of them he had to come up with something that uh, was not just spectacular, super spectacular. When doctors start to um, uh, go back in the direction of the other end of the floor and set his paces, and everybody just uh, become emotionally really involved. People did not know what he was doing. I remember Doug Moe and a couple of guys over on the side because they were betting that I, I couldn't dunk the ball from there. And I had dunked the ball from there thousands of times. So Doc took off running and his afro was blowing in the wind. <laughs> and he took off from the free throw line. He flew in the air. I mean, he was a bird in the air. <laughs> when he came down with such a force, with the tomahawk slam, it's as if the whole arena went through the hoop with him. It was like a vacuum, and the place went crazy. All the players on the sidelines just jumped up and. Uh, was giving each other fives. Well, he used that particular event as his stage. He was magnificent. You know, when Dr. J did it, nobody had seen it up to that point. And the way he did it so easily, uh, man, it was very spectacular. You know, kind of established a, uh, a standard, a standard for slam dunking. From that point on, the slam dunk was in another stratosphere, and it was all thanks to Julia Serving. Doc was the guy walking in air before there was a real air. Uh, the interesting thing about that, that wasn't really one of my best dunks. <laughs> Coming up next, Julius Irving's championship season with the New York Mets when Dr. J and the ABA returns on Classic Sports Network. In 1973, Julius Irving became a New York Met and teamed up with young coach Kevin Lockery. Uh, offensively, he liked to see the firepower, and uh, you know that made for a pretty good transition for me uh, going there. And you know, three years, and that's uh, you know we're in a dominant team in the ABA. The season before Irving came to Long Island, the Nets won 30 games. His first year there, they won 55. And the doctor won his second straight scoring title and his first of three ABA MVP awards. What had been the stuff of myth in Virginia became reality in New York. And the ABA became Julius Irving's league. He used to do two dunks in the ABA. He would be coming on the fast break down on the right-hand side with Brian Taylor or John Williamson, and they would hit him, 
and as he turned the corner, he would take off, and he would be coming from the baseline, from the corner, and as he came to dunk it, he would tap the top of the box, which is 11 feet, and slam it down. Now, the first time he did that in the NBA, first couple times, they cut him down. And so he never did. He stopped doing it. On the middle of the fast break, he would come down and he would take off at the foul line and he would take it up with two hands. And if Artis Gilmore was back, the second strongest guy ever to play the game behind Will Chamberlain, at 7'2", 285, he would take it up with both hands and as Gilmore would go to block it, he would swing out to the left-hand side and if you came for the ball, he would come back over the top of you and slam it down. I want to tell you something. That's incredible. If he did that today in the NBA, he would have 9,000 commercials, okay? Not two or three. I remember one game specifically. The Nets played against the San Diego Conquistadors, and it was a game that went into four overtimes. And at the end of each sequence, the end of the fourth quarter, the end of each overtime, the ball went to Julius, and Julius scored to send in the next overtime. Eventually, the, the, the Nets won that game. Julius played uh, 66 minutes and scored 63 points. While the high-scoring games and spectacular dunks left everyone breathless, it was the Nets' championship in 1974 that validated Irving's claim to greatness. The Nets won more games than anyone in the ABA that season, and the playoffs was a coronation, not a contest. Kevin Lockery combined the talents of rookies Larry Keenan and Super John Williamson with veterans like center Bill Paltz to complement Irving and make the Nets unbeatable. The Nets lost only two games in their three postseason series. In the finals against the Utah Stars, Dr. J scored 47 points in game one as the Nets won their first ever championship in five games. Four seconds, Irving dribbling the clock down, two seconds, Irving tries finger rolls, no good, that is it, the Nets are number one. I think the Nets years were the most special of all the years. We didn't have any ego problems because it really was a one for all, all for one situation. And it was one of the rare times in which, you know, I experienced that and knew it to be true. And we all needed each other. Julius Irving carried the ABA torch for two more seasons. And while his years in the other league remain a mystery to most, those who were there swear they saw Dr. J at his best. I don't think there's any uh, question about it. No one, no one saw, uh, no one in the NBA saw what we saw his first couple of years in the ABA. Julius, his heyday was in the ABA. I mean, pe people have no idea how good Doc was, okay? I mean, they have absolutely no idea. <laughs> there were more highlights and highlights in the ABA, you know, because we had more wide open games, plus, you know, between age 21 and 26, you know, you're just letting it all hang out. Coming up next, Julius Irving joins us in Victory Yard to relive his second championship in the ABA, the 1976 ABA Finals against David Thompson, Bobby Jones, Dan Issel, and the rest of Larry Brown's Denver Nuggets, when Dr. J and the ABA returns on Classic Sports Network. He was number 32 when he was with the Nets in the ABA, and we're celebrating Dr. J and the ABA right now on Classic Sports. And he's with us in Victory Yard, and we're going to go back to a game that we're so happy to have uncovered. I mean, so, pe so many people, when you talk about the ABA, they say there's no evidence, but there's a little bit of evidence. Mm -hmm. And the 1976 final series between you guys and the Denver mm -hmm. Nuggets is part of it. Can you tell us about how these teams matched up? They had David Thompson, you had you, uh, <laughs> you had John Williamson. You well, had yeah, we had uh, Williamson, Brian Taylor. And uh, we had Kim Hughes in the middle, um, if I remember correctly, uh -huh. and uh, uh, Tim Bassett and Rich Jones at that time. He was an ABA right. veteran. That Rich, guy Rich had been House around. Jones he was and a Tim big, the Boogeyman big, big. Bassett. I mean, everybody, <laughs> everybody had nicknames on our team. Melchioni was Bonehead Melchioni. Nobody's you know, got good nicknames Cyclops, anymore like that. Brian B.T. Express Taylor, right, and Super John Williamson, and Al Skinner, and Al on that team. So uh, in Denver, they featured... Uh, David Thompson, Bobby uh, Jones. Dan Issel, Bobby Jones, your career, Byron been... Beck, right, uh, Ralph Simpson, and uh, you know, so they had a pretty good team. I mean, they had they had a strong team. They had handled us pretty well during the regular season. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, that was the uh, frightening part because they had the uh, uh, they had the home court advantage, and they had the altitude. And, you know, everybody had this psychological thing. When you went to Den Denver, you know, you were going to lose your breath. And, you know, a lot of teams had oxygen So you must have been thinking line. about it now if you're thinking about it today. <clears throat> I mean, you must have been thinking about it then if you're thinking about it now. Yeah, well, I, you know, it was probably a psychological uh, advantage that they had. Uh, and in the first quarter, believe me, if you ran all out, that's why they always like to have running teams. You know, you'd find your tongue hanging down and, you'd, you know, single to the coach, <laughs> take me out. But uh, prepping for this series... Uh, we had come off uh, playing San Antonio in a, in a tough series mm -hmm. and, uh, and knocking them off. And, uh, you know, that was team with Gervin and uh, a few other, a few former Nets, Billy Paltz and at Ari Keenan. Um, after facing that challenge, we had the Nuggets. We were not the favorite team, uh, but we were probably the more determined team. And, you know, the game is so much uh, willpower as much as physical capability. And I think our team had strong will, a stronger will than theirs, even though they might have been a little more talented. What was the mood in the league then, Doc? There was a, a franchise that didn't even get out of training camp. They folded. Uh, there were talks of merger, but there had to be things that had to be resolved in court. Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, it was down to seven teams. Uh, did it mean as mm -hmm. much, or six teams, uh, did it mean as much to win it then because the league was in a shrinking mode, or did it mm -hmm. mean more because the teams that were left were so good? I think it meant, uh, for me, you know, it meant so much because we had we had been a championship team in 74 and then went out in the first round in 75. So, and we had the same coach and we had the same nucleus. We had made a couple of trades. Uh, we had the same nucleus of players. And uh, this team was determined to make up for what had happened the previous year mm. when St. Louis had knocked us out. And, uh, and we were not going to be denied. And, as you know, it went down to six game, and we were down as much as 23 points. Don't give it away yet. Yeah. We're going to take this thing, this memory, one game at a time. Okay. Now, as I mentioned to you, these tapes and games of the ABA are so rare. We don't even have the first half of game one of the 1976 ABA finals, if you can believe it. But we do have the second half, or at least most of it, as it appeared on WOR-TV in New York. It was Steve Albert and Bob Goldshaw at the mic, and in case you're not sure, racing from Yonkers is coming up when the game is over. Let's see how it unfolded in Denver that day. We will get you back to game one of the 1976 ABA Finals as we celebrate Dr. J and the ABA here on Classic Sports in a moment. How much of this game is, uh, is crystal clear to you? I mean, you had an awesome game, but still you had so many great games in your career. Do you remember this? No, I don't, I don't remember it bit by bit. You know, I, I know coming down the stretch, uh, well, I know, I know there were a lot of don't plays. Away, yeah, I won't, I won't give away the, the We'll get uh, to that. We'll the get gym. to the end. But, uh, you know, Kevin Lockery coached a lot like Doug Collins coaches now. You know, he runs a lot of isolations. Um, you know, guys, uh, the game plan, you go through the game plan, and it's very exact. But as the game goes on, you know, he was able to make a lot of adjustments based on, you know, what he would see from having experiences as a player and right. being a good player. And uh, I see Doug do this with, with uh, Detroit all the time. And, and uh, the, the role that Grant Hill has now with them was very similar to my role, uh, you know, play a lot of uh, point forward, you know, where you're handling the ball, create isolations, either create stuff for yourself or set other guys up. Uh, as you... As you look back on this game and your thing that you had with Bobby Jones, you're handling him pretty good. Mm -hmm. What about the rivalry between you and him that may have developed as this series went along, which would play out later as you would come to Philadelphia with mm -hmm. him? It's an interesting question, you know, because uh, when Bobby first came in, I mean, this was, this was Bobby's third year, let's mm -hmm. say my fifth year. Uh, he didn't like me very much. He, he said, Why? He, he told me when he got to Philadelphia, he said, I didn't like you back then when you had that wild hair and you played so aggressively, you know, and I was, I was probably a little more vulgar than, than I became later on when we were teammates. But, uh, but he liked me a lot as a teammate, and, uh, and he liked me as a person after he got to know me. But it was always a great challenge for him because, you know, I was a high-scoring guy, and he was a great defensive player. And high-scoring guys, when they had good nights, they would always damage great defensive players' reputations. What do you mean vulgar? You were vulgar? Well, you know, I mean, I, I, I used to curse a lot on the course. On I the, know. On, but, on the court. But there was a lot of guys get who upset. did that. upset, yeah. You got upset, it but make, vulgar it does not come to mind. It didn't make me a bad apple, but uh, I, was, I was more vulgar than Bobby. I thought you looked Let's pretty cool. Let's put it that way. <laughs> the fro was cool, I thought, yeah. though. Yeah. Because it made you seem like about 6'9". I was into the period. You mm -hmm. know, and I think the, 
you know, I dealt with alter egos. Uh, Dr. J was one character. I think Julie Serling was another. And on the court, you know, this this player came out. This, this energy came out. You know, off the court, I really didn't want to be perceived that way. I was basically kind of quiet and shy and a good listener, and uh, you know, more of a student off the court. But on the court, uh, I was into you know, teaching guys what I knew. That guy on the playground who called you the doctor because you called him the professor? Yeah. You know what? You look like you're the professor today <laughs> with the glasses and the, and the suit and everything, but that's all, part of the, that's all part of the legend. As we go back now to pick this up in the second half, it's still uh, heading into the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. You guys have built up a little bit of a lead. It's noisy yeah. in Denver, and you've got that altitude thing, and you're yeah. in the midst of a game uh, where the point total is going to be noteworthy. Is this, as we watch it, one of the top ten games of your career, or, or not even that? Uh, I would have to say yes. Oh, good. I, okay. I think I think uh, at the beginning of that series, uh, I was I was playing basketball as well as I could ever play, and uh, really ever hoped to play. I mean, it was the prime uh, time of my career at age 26. I think between that window, between 26 and 30, or 20, 26 and 32. You're at your best. It's when physically you know what's going on and mentally you know what's going on. You know what it takes to win. And this was, this was a game that we were not favored in. So, uh, you know, no matter what kind of lead you had on the Nuggets, you know they were always going to come back. And if I'm not mistaken, the summer before you had played in the Rucker, maybe for one of the last times, right? I had played. Unbelievable. Uh, yeah. yeah, I had played the summer. Imagine as you watch this then, it's one of the top ten games in the career of one of the best 50 players in the history of the NBA. And in that regard, he's right at the top of the list. And that this was a player who prior to that could be seen on a Rucker playground on the streets of New York. It was an amazing time in basketball in America. Let's go back now to Denver, Colorado. Once again, it's Steve Albert and Bob Goldshaw at the mic as it appeared on WOR-TV in New York. It was Julia Serving's New York Nets up by six, game one of the 76 ABA Finals. So in typical ABA style, it was pretty wide open. And a high-scoring game one of the ABA Finals in 76. Dr. J is in with Kevin Lockery and the rest of your teammates. John Williamson is an option with four seconds to go. Maybe not in your mind, but maybe in, in the minds <laughs> of Denver. Uh, what did you think of in last-second situations like this? Was it healthy for you to take the shot, or was it healthier for you to be the diversion so that someone like a Super John could take it? Well, I think it's healthier for me to take the shot. You know, be <laughs> okay. A medium-range shot or try to take the ball to the hoop. And then you got to look at who's defending you and what they do well. I mean, some guys are better at blocking shots. Other guys are better at knocking the ball mm -hmm. away. Some guys are better at drawing charges. Uh, Bobby happened to be good in all those areas. He was probably less of a shot blocker man-to-man. -man. He was better as a block shocker when, shot, shot, uh, shot blocker when he's trying to help out. Because he's so, had a good so game. So playing you straight up, you know, he'd always play you for the drive, and then he'd play you to run into him, play you for the charge. Because you've had such a good game against him, do you feel partly like you've gotten him beaten already because of that? at least mentally, or not? Well, I mean, I knew that I could elevate and shoot over him, and I wasn't worried about, you know, I think, I think there was more risk in driving the ball to the hoop than there is in pulling up and shooting a jump shot against a player like him. Because he's always going to have his body in the right position, but he's not going to leave his feet unless he's absolutely sure. Would Kevin Lockery at this point have drawn something, or would he basically just say, you come off a low screen and we're getting the ball to you, Doc, and... Well, it depends on where the ball's been taken out from. I mean, in this situation, we had set plays from out of bounds, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then there's, you know, plays to be created. Uh, I'm not sure what happened in this one. How about yeah. four seconds to go? When I tell you you've got four seconds to go on an inbounds play, what do you say in your head that you've got time to do? I feel as though uh, if the score is tied, it's a no-lose situation. You know, I've got I to take the shot right. uh, when I'm comfortable and when I want to take the shot. Uh, if I can take it, you know, where there's a couple of ticks on the clock, so we got a chance for an offensive rebound if it misses, fine. But you don't want to leave enough time for them to get a rebound call timeout and then have another crack at the basket. If this is one of the top ten games in your career, which you said earlier, what about this shot in, in a final situation without giving it away? Was this a, oh boy. I'll tell you what, we'll do this one in a moment. <laughs> okay. I got trapped there, I don't want to ruin it. Okay, so let's go back now. It's 118, 118, Denver Nets, game one, 76 finals, and four seconds are left. So the shot falls, and the Nets take a one to nothing lead in that best of seven series. How about it? I almost ruined it before, but <laughs> top 10 games, how about top 10 shots? Buzzer beater, final situation? Well, I, you know, I, I made a three-pointer against Boston in the Spectrum one night off of a jump ball between Charles Barkley and McHale. Uh, a shot from the other side of half court against Dallas, which was uh, obviously a three-pointer. When the score was 120-120 and everybody was kind of settling in, waiting for the overtime. Mm -hmm. 
You're setting me I, up for this. Yeah, was pretty yeah, good, but not yeah, one of the all times. Yeah, I, I had some, I had some shots that are memorable. Uh, this one, because it was not that far away from the basket, uh, the significance of it was huge, but the shot was somewhat routine. Now, Doc, uh, routine. so rare for people today to get a chance to to see this game. I mean, we're really excited that we could allow everybody to see it. How about you? How many times have you gone back and looked at tapes of, of you playing in the ABA? Well, you don't even have probably any tapes. Yeah, I, I, I have some ABA footage, um, but it's very rare for me, too. I haven't been able to On a free sit down and enjoy it. And, you know, I'm thinking about my 15-year-old son while we're talking about this because uh, he's playing, he's a sophomore in high school now. And I, I don't think he's ever seen any ABA footage other than the slam dunk contest. I think it's time, Doc. Yeah, I think, yeah, it, I think I'll let him know. So you, you could was. get a kick if, I, if you had a free night yeah. and I handed you the 76 second half of game one. You'd get a kick out of having no, a nice no series. No yeah. question. It would be great. All right. Now, the series Fantastic. continued. The Nets had a chance to wrap it up in game five in Denver and claim their second ABA championship, but it didn't happen. So the scene was set in game six in New York, and we'll talk about that in a moment with Dr. J, Julia Serving on Classic Sports in a moment. As we mentioned, the New York Nets had gone to Denver for a game five and lost a chance to win the series. And it's amazing to me as I've been in sports for so long to see what an emotional up and down a seven game series is. There are times when you think, oh, it's not happening. Yeah. Then there are times you think you can't lose. And then there's another time when you yeah. think you can't win. How crushing was it, do you remember, to lose that game five? Well, you know, the weirdest thing is that we had not won in that building all year prior to that first game. So uh, although we had hopes of winning, uh, realistically, uh, we, didn't, we didn't think we were going to win. Uh, going back to Denver, and, you know they had they had such a great uh, home record. I mean that year, I think they had won 63 games or what have you. So they were very dominant at home, and uh, the one we got gave us the home court advantage. So we felt, felt very comfortable that we now had the home court advantage. We didn't want to come home and lose that and force a seventh game, which would be back in Denver. Right. So uh, we don't have again a lot of Game Six because so little exists of any of these games. But mm -hmm. we do have. Enough to give you a sense of what happened. You guys are down by 22 points at one point in the second half. Mm -hmm. Did you allow yourself, as you, as you knew going back to Game 7 in Denver was mm -hmm. not something you yeah. wanted to do, yeah, did you allow yourself to think that now you had to get ready for it, that possibility? It, it's now or never. I mean, this is the last ABA championship. If we're going to win it, we have to win this game. There's no question about it. Uh, if we go back to Denver... Uh, the advantage, they'd have such an advantage over us. There so you no, were thinking, There was no way we were going to win. This is if, we don't, if we don't win the sixth game, we don't. We don't win a seven. Steal by Dr. J. Dr. J. Give it to Dr. That's what they do. So they have trimmed it to 14 points. It's going to be a significant uh, end of game six for John Williamson, too. Uh, tell us a little about the late, great, super John Williamson. Well, you know, Soup was one of those players who uh, you hate to play against, but you love to have on your team, you know, because he's so unpredictable. You don't know what he's going to do from, from, from game to game. Uh, you don't know what he's going to come in in a good mood, smiling and joking. He's going to come in with an attitude, what have you. But if he's on your team, you know, you know what the, uh, what the pen words were, you know, how to bring him into the fold. And I knew better than anybody because John had a tremendous amount of respect for me, but he never respected our opponents. And uh, he had a tremendous amount of respect for the game and, you know, for himself. And he was a warrior. He was uh, like Andrew Tony, who I had later on uh, in my career uh, as a teammate, uh, a guy who you had to harness to a degree, but there were sometimes, if you just let him go, he could score on anybody. Williamson, Williamson, open. <laughs> Williamson. Williamson finds the shot, got it. I tell you, John Williamson believes he can score off anybody. Would it surprise you, uh, as you look back at this game, to see how dominant he could be in, in such a critical situation for your team? I mean, this is a game where, if I say one net dominated game six that could give the Nets a championship, it's going to be you. Yeah. But for some I reason... Didn't, I didn't have a bad game. Hey, I'm not I saying you had a like, bad game, Doc. <laughs> what was it, like but if 31, you're telling me 16, 16, something if, like that? But if I tell you uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. one of the guys is going to have 16 points in the fourth quarter, right. for as good as he was, mm -hmm. I don't think it would be him. What does that tell everybody about, about him? Uh, just about his physical gifts and his, his attitude, his focus. Uh, 16 points in a quarter, you know, John could do that on any given night. Whether it was going to be first, second, third, or fourth, he probably couldn't do it for four quarters, uh, wouldn't do it for four quarters, but 
on any given night. And I think there were other nights in which he had 16 or 17 points in a quarter. Mm -hmm. And this one, in being the most significant game in the history of the franchise, just made it that much more gratifying, you know, for all of us because I mean, he was one of us. I was 15, used to play him one-on-one -on -one after practice all the time. And of course, I never won. But one day, I, I was winning. I was a point away, and he comes back, and he ties me. And then he gets the ball, and he slaps his hand in my chest, and yeah. literally takes me and throws me to the floor and lays it in and looked at me and said, you didn't think you were going to beat me, did you? <laughs> that's the competitive that's juice. John had the competitive juices and, you know, the Warriors mentality. Ten seconds to the championship. Skinner has the ball. Five seconds to the championship. It does. It's all over. It's all over with three seconds to go. And the crowd storms onto the court. One second. The clock is out and the ball game's over. Pandemonium as the New York Nets win 112-106. When the game is over and you guys win, you beat Denver at the Nassau Coliseum, mm -hmm. big crowd. Was there a moment of quiet reflection that the ABA and, and everything that had been was over? Did you think about that or was it just sheer euphoria that you had won a championship? Well, I think the euphoria that we had won the championship and that, you know, we had uh, sort of cleaned the skeleton out of the closet uh, from uh, getting knocked out the previous year when we were, by, by a team that we were better than, mm -hmm. uh, Spirit of St. Louis. Um, the idea of it being the last ABA game, I think at this time the Nets and Nuggets had already made application into the NBA. And uh, we knew that those franchises were no longer going to be ABA franchises, um, whether there would be an ABA or not. It was unlikely um, where each of us would be. Uh, that was to be decided. Doc called it himself the prime of his career. That year in 1976, he helped the Nets win their second ABA championship. And one of the men who was there at the microphone at a young age for him as well was Steve Albert, who recalls how good Doc was in 76. And I'll never forget, in that series, he averaged close to 38 points a game, better than 14 rebounds, and he shot 60% from the field and this when being guarded by the premier defensive forward in the league uh, Bobby Jones and it really it was only fitting that Dr. J Julius Irving won that last ABA title. A couple of minutes for some final thoughts from Dr. J Julius Irving who in 1976 following the absorption of the four ABA teams into the NBA was sold by then owner Roy Bow of the Nets to the Philadelphia 76ers because Roy Bow just couldn't afford it. Now, in a book by Terry Pluto called uh, Loose Balls about the ABA, Roy Bow talks about offering you to the New York Knicks, which would have, well, it would have changed the course of history of basketball in New York and been one of the greatest things to ever happen to the Knicks franchise. Do you remember any such thing? Well, there was discussion about the Knicks when I reached my impasse with the Nets and it was decided that I was no longer going to be a Net. And uh, I selected three franchises, uh, New York, Philadelphia, because of the commutability, right. and uh, Los Angeles, just for the idea of changing the environment all, the, all together. <coughs> and a uh, decision was made by uh, Roy Bow that he would not sell my contract to the Knicks, that it was gonna either going to be Philadelphia or Los Angeles, and I selected Philadelphia. A lot of people look at times like that as an exciting time. Other times, people look at that and say, eh, they don't like all the indecision, they don't like all the change and all that. What do you look back on that time for you? Was there uh, the sadness of the ABA being over? Was it uh, uneasiness about your own future? What was it? I, I was never uneasy about my future. I mean, I knew that I could play basketball and I could play at some level, whether it was in America or in Europe or with the Globetrotters, what have you. I was going to have an opportunity to play basketball. Mm -hmm. uh, being vice president of the Players Association, I was concerned about the fate of the other players in the ABA, and that was something that, as an association, we fought very hard for uh, with this absorption and they ended up having a dispersal draft uh, so that, you know, players like Moses Malone, Maurice Lucas ended up, you know, uh, in Portland and mm -hmm. made them a championship team right. with Dave Twardzik. And um, other guys were dispersed around the league and then the guys who uh, didn't have guaranteed contracts were still compensated to a degree. You mentioned Mo Lucas, yourself, obviously, <laughs> Bobby Jones, uh, guys who made a name for themselves in the quote-unquote inferior ABA who went on and were a big part of the top 10 categories in a lot of uh, areas of the NBA, represented the All-Star game, if I'm not mistaken, 14 guys that next year were in the NBA. I think mean, it was 11, 11 out of 24. 11. And then the three guys who had played some in the ABA, like Rick Barry and Charlie Scott, who had played some, but they didn't go in that particular year, but they had played part of their career. In was the that NBA. personally satisfying to you to, to see these guys prove themselves where, where a lot of people thought they couldn't? Uh, very much so. 
you know, the, the knock had been that uh, we were uh, an inferior league. Uh, you know, our, and our rationalization was that maybe we didn't have the depth of the NBA, but we knew that the uh, cream of the ABA uh, was as good as the cream in the NBA, and that All-Star Weekend proved that. Hey, Doc, if there's one guy who should sign a red, white, and blue ball that's <laughs> endorsed by the NBA, it's you. Would you please sign this for us so we can keep it forever here? No problem. Thanks a lot. All right. 50 years to get there, huh? Well, it took you 50 years. <laughs> there we go. He's Dr. J. Julius Irving, the one and only, one of the best 50 players in the history of the league. And appropriately, he's going to put his signature on a ball that uh, carries through the generations of basketball, red, white, and blue, and of course in the NBA today. Our thanks for joining us here on Classic Sports as we celebrated Dr. J and the ABA. We'll see you again soon.